Hi, I'm Eric. I filmed my phone and welcome to another video. Today we are getting back into Madonna with her 1998 album, Ray of Light. I have gotten into two Madonna records on this channel. That would be Confessions on the Dance Floor and American Life. Very different projects. And Ray of Light, I have no idea if it's going to be similar or different to either of them. I am just going to be trying to vibe. It seems shiny and light based on the cover, the title of the album, and it feels like we're actually in full spring as I'm reacting to this. Like, I wore an actual sweater and pants today, but you also could have easily worn a t-shirt and shorts at some points of it, and it's nice. Even though climate change is definitely real, it does feel nice when they pretend like it's not. I'm also not feeling the best. I feel a little nauseous, so I'm going to be drinking some mint tea during this, but I'm also hoping that this album poses a form of distraction against that because I've been feeling it for a few hours now and nothing has been acted upon so we're just gonna keep vibing. But just so you're aware in case my comments are a little more brief or just are not as nuanced as they could be otherwise. But anyway this album is an hour and six minutes long so I gotta get into it. I'm excited but I gotta get into it. Thank you for requesting this video and anyway let's get into it. Track number one is Drowned World slash Substitute for Love. Starting with Basically the two tracks on. Ooh, feels nighttimey. But she's singing so slowly and like as if this is ballad time. Oh, and just as I said that, percussion comes in. Should I wait for you, my substitute? Ooh, what is that? I don't know, but I like it. I never felt so happy. Oh, we got more acoustic. Oh, woke up. Oh, this is gonna sound incredible in headphones, isn't it? It's beeping. It's getting interesting. <laughs> I find I've changed. You've changed your mind. So that was Drowned World slash Substitute for Love and an interesting way to start off. Okay. Hmm. I don't know. It's a slow-ish way and I feel like based on the length of these songs it will be maybe a slower project or at least a project that takes its time rather because we have only 13 songs, which is just one more than Confessions on the Dance Floor, but it is an hour and six minutes. So we're gonna be in for, I think, a journey of sorts. At the beginning, I was not really that connected to it. I was also just trying to find a pillow for my back because we deal with multiple, you know, things happening at once. <laughs> there also wasn't much that I was connecting to, and so I didn't really have much to say. And once it came in, like, oh, like, I don't know, the three minute, four minute mark, I don't know when it started doing the thing it did. Well, probably like three minutes. When it woke up, that made me wake up a little bit more and make me feel like there was more life to it. It felt, especially during the beginning part, almost like the energy of a Bjork song without the Bjork vocals or any weird micro beats happening. And then when it came alive, it still had some of that Bjorkness. But I feel like before, it related to Bjork in the more atmospheric idea, whereas towards the end, it got more production, it got more maximalist, it got more interesting. And I don't know, I fell in love with the song more I listened to it. I don't know if I'm actually in love with it yet, but I think with that last two minutes, I felt like it proved to me that there is potential for it to grow on me. And I feel like this is an album that, especially if it's something that it takes its time to listen to, you similarly have to take your time to listen to it. And I am ready to take that time. Track number two is Swim. Ooh, it is starting a little more sporadic. This sounds a little familiar. Put your head on my shoulder. Ooh, like it's getting deeper. Crash into the other shore or swing to the ocean floor. 
We can't carry these sins on our back. It's kind of giving a little jagged little pill vibe. Let the water wash all over you. Swim to the ocean floor. So that was Swim, and ooh, I liked that groove. It was a groovy track. It very much reminded me of Jagged Little Pill sounds, or even just the 90s singer-songwriter vibes of Alanis and Fiona, and a little bit of Alarm Call from Bjork as well, because I feel like that's Bjork almost channeling that energy as well. It makes me feel like we're in for a treat that's really a product of its time, which is the 90s, which is an era I would love to get more into music-wise, and so I know I got into it more because of y'all, and I feel like I'm excited to continue hearing some sounds from this project. It feels a little different than I anticipated. I thought it was going to be more sunshiny and vibrant, and maybe we'll get some of that later, but it feels a little, like, dark and edgy, and I always feel like the 90s are very grungy, and... I don't know a lot of the terms because I know the grunge is a very specific movement and punk is a very specific movement. But for me, the sound of alternative being the mainstream is how I would argue the 90s to me in my head is like. She's saying that she can't carry all these scents on her back. She needs to swim to the ocean floor, which might mean drowning. So yikes on that. And I guess... Before, we had Drowned World slash of the Two for Love, which I didn't really talk about lyrically, but it, there's also some darkness in it, in that, for me, when I hear it for the very first time, I'm like, oh, this person is a substitute for love, or this thing is a substitute for love. And she's wondering if she should wait for that, because she doesn't know if she's actually going to get love. And that's a really sad thought. And, oh gosh, it's like, you find this person and you're like, oh, they seem great and wonderful and you're like comfortable in that relationship, but you're not in love. And what are you supposed to do? Because it's safer to just stay there and be that substitute. Should you continue living that life or should you actually find the love that you want and that you deserve? I think some people, will prefer one or the other. I don't think everyone's going to pick the riskier decision, and I don't think everyone has to. And then Swim also has a similarly dark message of Swim to the Ocean Floor, which could be drowning, and then Crash into the Other Shore, which is, like, not good either. So, I don't know. It feels vaguely uplifting, but maybe that's just how it sounds versus what the actual content is. I'm, again, not looking up lyrics. It's a long album. I'm tired. And I think some of my thoughts are more insightful and interesting when I'm not trying to just go an outside digital source because you all can look up Genius Lyrics or wherever this is on. I remember it was lyric meanings or something like that. I don't remember what I used for Atlantis, but I felt like I used that one much more in terms of analyzing lyrics. Song meanings, I think it was called, actually. So... Yeah, I know I could probably look those up and figure out those ways, but that content is already available. You know, what's not available is my reaction to it. Sorry, that's just a little tangent about my philosophy of it. If I do a Kate Bush reaction again, I will always, always look up lyrics. But yeah, this is shaping up to be a very interesting record. Excited to see where we go next. Track number three is Ray of Light, the album title. Okay, it does feel a little more in a major key. Good morning. Ooh. That's a drop. Oh, no, that's the second verse. I'm trying to remember where it all began. That falsetto, girl, you using your higher register here. I feel like I just got home. Quicker than a ray of light. Gone for someone else. She's got herself a universe. Ooh, give it a little rasp there. Ah! 
We're going to the Ray of Light. I'm flying. Okay. So that was Ray of Light, and that was euphoric. Oh my gosh. Y'all are just going to turn the entire sound into something completely different. Okay. I see y'all. I feel y'all. And I feel like coming home, and I feel like I'm going to fly. And Oh gosh, this is like... I don't actually know what this looks about at all. I think it's the Dancing with Tears in My Eyes vibe because it's quicker than a ray of light. But then I felt like there was something of like Tears of Mourning or something. We're saying that's that quicker than a ray of light and they're gone or something like that. I don't really know if it's like suddenly I feel all this love or this person was suddenly lovely and then suddenly not in my life. I don't really know. But it's a good song. I vibe with it. If y'all have thoughts on what it's about, y'all can let me know. But what y'all can't argue with me about is that this is a gosh darn bop. I think the song showcases her ability to write a dance floor anthem while also being in the times of not confession of the dance floor. That she's able to do that while also taking some elements that were popular in the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, I think she's vibing with it hard. And I'm vibing with it hard. Track number four is Candy Perfume Girl. Oh, still Cynthia. Oh yeah, this feels like we're taking it back. Ooh, that sounded different. I'm your Candy Perfume Girl. Ah, oh, that still sounds Lanasy. Close it. For my infatuation junkie. Oh, that's an interesting breakdown. Good night. <laughs> Something's escalating. Heterosexuality be like. So this candy perfume girl, and honestly, I was more enraptured by the production that I really didn't know what was happening lyrically at all. I heard Candy Perfume Girl a million times, probably, but I didn't really get much else from it. Although that wake up part was very distinct. So my thoughts is that Candy Perfume sounds sweet. It sounds feminine-ish. I mean, gender is a construct, but you get the point saying, oh, she's sweet, you know, she's sugar and spice and everything nice. But I think she doesn't want to be that candy perfume girl and that she's more than that. And that that boy is maybe projecting on her what he wants in a woman. Because there's that part where she says candy perfume boy. I don't know if that's anything queer at all. It might be, but I have not read that deep into this. I feel like this production was really cool though. I think it gives Alana. This song sounds like they co-wrote it together, honestly. Is she trying to make a Jagged Little Pill or supposed former Infatuation Junkie album here? Because she's doing a pretty decent job. Candy Perfume Girl, it feels like a song that, yeah, it feels like I don't want to be these standards, almost like a right through you. But it feels more SFIJ more than Jagged Little Pill just because of the different sounds. I feel like SFIJ goes into further directions and I feel like her voice settles a little more. I feel like Ray of Light was almost like a so pure. There was definitely more Madonna in that, but this one, oh my God, if someone said that Madonna had this song and it went to Alanis, no, because Alanis always writes her own songs. Then if Alanis had the song and then she sent it to Madonna, I would believe them. It feels like it. Maybe I'm right. But I also don't think that Madonna takes songs that she didn't write. So maybe they co-wrote it, or maybe it has nothing to do with Alanis at all. It just has a sound, a like feel. Either way, it's good. I don't know what the song's about, but I'll listen to it again. Track number five is Skin. And it looks like it's gonna be the longest song on the album with just over six minutes, but let's get into it. Do I know you from somewhere? Who are you? Your hand on my skin? That was such a whispery, ominous tone. Oh, it's getting eerie in here. I need to make a connection. I need to make a connection. Girl. 
I want to make a correction. I'm not like this all the time. Me neither. Ooh, these filters are getting extra. I need to have your protection. Okay, rhyming. Oh, brought it down and brought it back up. Okay, instrumental synth break. Just me, I'm trying. So that was skin, and it sounds like Madonna is feeling flirtatious and catching some feelings and may be in the mood a bit. Yeah, I would say that's probably pretty accurate. She's like, put your hand on my skin. Touch me, I'm trying. Yeah, she wants that physical connection. And she's a little stunned by this person because she's like, I feel like I know you from somewhere. And you make me want more. And I feel like everything I say to you is some of the silly things I've said in the past. And she wants to, yeah, make it happen. She wants to lock it down, I think. Yeah, this is a flirtatious song that is very repetitive, but it is a dance type track and it is fun. Yeah, I mean, it's still definitely based in the time of the 90s. I'm sure she's inspired by sounds she hears at the time, but she's also probably inventing some of these sounds that I'm familiar with because of other artists. I highly doubt that one of the most successful pop artists of all time paved her way by only taking sounds that were popular from other artists at the time. And I feel like this is such an experimental song that I vibe with. It's experimental, it's dance, it's fun. I want to listen to this again, for sure. I could see this album being turned into some sort of nonstop dance remix, especially with this song. At least this song can. I don't know about the others. I don't know if it was ever a single or anything. Does it look like it has any more plays than the other songs on the album significantly? It looks like Ray of Light has a good amount. Nothing Really Matters has a decent more. Frozen, The Power of Goodbye, and the others follow a similar pattern with the rest of the song. So I guess this was never a single. It doesn't really make sense as a single, but I could see it getting an extended dance cut. I could see someone wanting to play this song at a club, even if not everyone in the club knows it. It's definitely a fun song. It shows a side of her that we are familiar with. It does feel a little like get together-esque, but you know, more in the time of 1998 rather than 2005. Track number six is Nothing Really Matters. Oh gosh, you didn't have to say it like that. Quiet, but also seems like some scanning error sound. Sounds like almost like the beginning of Karma. Nothing really mattered about making myself happy. I'll never be the same, and it's getting ominous. Okay, it's a dance song. Everything I'd give you comes right back to me. I realized no nobody wins. I didn't realize we were getting a Nihilus spot tonight. <laughs> Love is all we need. Okay. Give me comfort in your arms. I love this slower part happening while the beat's still fast. So that was Nothing Really Matters. And that was a bop that I didn't expect to happen. It started a little slow at the beginning, but just like in Karma from Taylor, it comes to the forefront. And this is a nihilist bop, but it's also a bop about being in love. That nothing really matters, but love is actually all we need. Like I can find comfort in your arms. Just like before with nobody knows me, like you know me. It kind of makes the central theme of love that much more important because nothing else actually does matter. In her opinion, you can have your own opinions on that. I don't know. I think love is important, but I don't think it's always the thing that brings me happiness. I guess you could say that love is much broader than romantic love. And I would say that the daughter probably agrees and I don't know what she means in this case, if she's meaning just romantic love or she's meaning like the love you get from your family, the love you get from other people, the love you get for the world, like the love that you give as much as the love that you receive. Yeah, I it could be that as well. And I would agree with that much more. 
but I also feel satisfied and happy from accomplishments that I do. Ways I help people. And it's not necessarily love. I think kindness can be part of love, but also kindness can happen on its own without it being connected to love, if that makes sense. But yeah, I did bop to it. I probably will listen to it again. I love all the extra parts in it. It makes it feel almost like a precursor to Confessions on the Dance Floor. It did come out before, so it does make sense. But it's a little more experimental. It's a little more 90s feeling to me as someone who was only alive for four months of the 90s. I still consider myself a 90s baby though, because I was. Track number seven, Sky Fits Heaven. Sky fits heaven, so fly it? That's what the prophet said? To you? Who is this? Watching the signs as you go. Everyone's traveling down their own road. It's, I'm, I think I'm gonna follow my heart. It's a very good place to start. Oh, that drum fell. We're gonna go with this. Ooh. Oh, slowing it down for that? Not for long. Getting a little syncopated to outro. Oh, that was a good transition. So that was Sky Fits Heaven. And that's like the precursor to Jump in a way. I'm sorry to keep comparing these songs to other songs, but it's how I get connections and start to feel the music is by taking what I knew before and then I'll get new stuff when I listen to it more but this song is really about looking towards the future I feel like it plays on the idea of like if the shoe fits then wear it where it's sky fits heaven so fly it and you have a lot of people or places from where this information is coming from, the wise man, the gospel. That's what our future should hold. Just her own words. And she's saying that she's traveling down the road and following the signs and everyone's traveling down their own road and following the signs. And she's gonna follow her heart because it's a very good place to start. It's a great rhyme. <laughs> that sounds wonderful when it rolls off the tongue. Again, I really like this production. It feels like the 90s version of Confessions of the Dance Floor where it's not taking back the 80s sound and it's not in the current 2000s sound, it's very much grounded in its time in a lovely way because I haven't really heard 90s dance music at all. And I like it a lot because songs that sound like Alanis and Fiona, songs from them, generally speaking, they're not the ones that you're gonna be dancing in a club to at all. You just aren't, but these songs you definitely could and I wonder how popular this album was when it came out. It is Madonna after all so I'm sure it's not gonna be not popular at all but it's really lovely. I really am enjoying this journey that I'm on. My nausea started to clear up. I did start chewing some more peppermint gum so if I'm chewing my apologies but it is what I gotta do but this album is helping a lot. And I'm really excited to continue listening to it tonight as well as re-listening more. Track number eight is Shanti slash Ashtangi. Ashtangi. I don't know how to pronounce either of those. I don't want to look them up for fear of spoiling it. So I will probably look it up after the fact. But for now, Shanti, Ashtangi. Sound good? Is this in English? It's definitely not in English. Oh, wow. That's such an interesting sound. I like the groove of this, and it is kind of soothing in a way. So that was Shanti. Ashtangi. I definitely know Shanti from the song. I didn't hear Ashtangi, to my knowledge. So I do not know if I'm saying that right. However, that is Sanskrit. Okay, vibes. I love some Sanskrit. <laughs> Apparently these are two prayers that are used when Madonna does yoga and the tradition of yoga that she practices does them. I believe they're Buddhist. Yeah, maybe. 
I felt like she also said there were Vedic prayers, which I thought the Vedas was for Hinduism. So it's definitely something in East Asian spirituality. Feel free to correct me down in the comments below. I haven't done much research on this because I do want to keep my research on this brief so I can stick to what I hear. But I really enjoyed it. It was cool that she's putting this modern sound with these very traditional prayers. It's interesting. It's not something I expected on this album. Because I heard Isaac, I know that she's totally cool with having other languages in her songs and singing in other languages. Actually, she didn't sing in another language on Isaac. I didn't know that she could. But I knew La Isla Bonita. I don't know the whole album that that's from, but I did see a drag performance of it. So that's actually the main reason why I do know the song exists. But La Isla Bonita is pretty simple Spanish. And especially for people in the United States, we hear Spanish much more frequently than we hear Sanskrit, generally speaking, unless you're in a specific culture in the United States. But I feel like the everyday American knows a little bit of Spanish just because of how they interact with the world, at least more than Sanskrit. But I do like that she did this experimentation. It's definitely showing a more experimental album. I wouldn't have put this on the same album as the Sky Fits Heaven or even Swim. Maybe Swim and this would have been together. But then, oh, there's just so many different sounds on this album. It's very interesting. Ray of Light, even. Oh my gosh. There's a lot going on here. And so it is starting to feel more supposed to form an infatuation junkie in that maybe the album isn't sonically cohesive, but does it have to matter? Track number nine is Frozen. Starting a little cinematically. The string section is getting ominous. You only see what your eyes want to see? You're frozen when your heart's not open. Ooh. That was an ominous drum beat. You're broken when your heart's not open. Okay. She's telling us to open up. It's not as heavy as I thought it was going to be. Feels a little, still restrained, even that, though that drum beat is fun. Cut it out? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Is it gonna get bigger? Let all the hurt inside of you die. That's hard. Okay, the orchestra came back in. Oh, at first I thought it was gonna get louder. Felt louder at first. If I can melt your heart, we never be apart. Oh, acapella moment, okay. So that was Frozen, and I don't get the hype. This is the most streamed song on the album? Why? I mean, I guess it was probably a single. It's not really for me. I kept thinking it was gonna build to something more. And I don't know, it gets a rise out of me. It makes me think that more is going to happen and it's going to climax eventually, but it never really does. I guess that could be the point of the song Frozen, because if you're not open, you're frozen and you're broken and you're not going to change because you're not allowing yourself to be vulnerable, which allows you to grow. I get that, but that doesn't make it for a fun listening experience. I mean, it's not an uplifting song. I guess it is, like, you do have to change to grow as a person. I get that that can be uplifting because it means the power is within you. You don't have to rely on other people. That's wonderful. But I don't know. Maybe it's something that really just doesn't sound as good mixed out loud as it does in headphones. I don't have to try it, but yeah, I mean, it's not a bad song by any means. It just kind of felt like there was no satisfying drop to me. It wasn't that satisfying. The, there was still some tension in there. And I don't know, it really just, there was never a time for it to release ever. And I guess, again, that goes with the message of the song, but that, again, doesn't make me want to listen to it anymore. Track number 10, The Power of Goodbye. This one also has a decent amount of streams. Frozen's still having the most. Have you been listening to the same album I have? That was not the standout. But again, we're over that now. We're going to go into The Power of Goodbye. <laughs> Okay, it's getting atmospheric again. 
your heart is not open? Oh, is this a direct continuation? You are my lesson. You are my lesson. Ooh. I was your fortress you had to burn. There's nothing left to try. Ooh. There's no greater power than the power of goodbye. Some 90s vibes in the back. Ooh, that feels a little more satisfying there. So that was the power of goodbye. And that was a cool little ballad. But that's what it is. It felt cold. I think from the frozen part before. I don't know. It got very like I feel like I was getting a chill. I mean, I guess the sun is down, so it could be getting colder outside. When I woke up this morning it was forty five degrees, which was wild to me, but it was happening. But she's learning to say goodbye to this person. They were a lesson for her. She was a lesson for them. They have to go their separate ways. They don't still talk or hang out or anything like that. They are separate now. And I see it as a continuation. Were these two songs big on TikTok or did they have a really cool double music video or something like that? Because I'm surprised that, first of all, we have two songs back to back on an album that have a lot more outstanding plays. I mean, if The Power of Goodbye was on the radio during that time, in particular, I'm not big of a ballad person on the radio. If you want to listen to your ballads, you listen to your ballads. But I don't want to listen to it while I am driving in my car. I want something upbeat or at least to have some more like electric guitar or some heavier synths in it that make it a little bit of a more rock edge. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But while I can see the title track getting standout mention for sure because that song is very euphoric and very different than the rest of the album, these two... Y'all picking these two? These might be my bottom two so far on the project. I don't know that for sure because I haven't heard everything. And The Power of Goodbye is not a bad song. It just isn't the song I'm ready to listen to right now. It just is like a relaxed pop song. It just doesn't feel as unique as a lot of these other songs or remind me of songs that I find very interesting. This one's like chill, I guess, but it's very forgettable, honestly. Track number 11 is To Have and Not To Hold. Oh, this has some interesting grooves. I can tell there's already so many layers. So hot and yet so cold. You never do anything to make me want to stay. Ooh. I go straight to you. Oh, maybe she is into them. Oh, they're to have and not to hold. To have not to hold. So that was To Have and Not To Hold, and I think this song is pretty straightforward at this point for me. I feel like she wants this person, but she's learned they're to have and not to hold, which basically means you get them in this moment, but you don't get to really keep them. They're not yours. You don't own them, and obviously you don't own people, but also means that it's more casual than a marriage or something akin to that. Production-wise, I really liked it. It was groovy. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Shanti Ashtangi, if I remember it right. I mean, after hearing two songs I really didn't care too much about. It was hard to remember. But it had a good groove. There was definitely layers in it. It felt very muffled throughout the whole time, and I really enjoyed how it was produced. I would enjoy it more if it wasn't after two songs that were a little underwhelming for me. I feel like I could have enjoyed it more if it was earlier in the project, even though I feel like with Frozen and The Power of Goodbye, it makes sense thematically. It makes sense to have them all together. If she put to have and not to hold before Frozen, then I would vibe with it more and maybe it would get more attention. I like it. I don't think I'll listen to it too much. And the reason for that is mainly because I can't really deal with listening to that type of music. It would make me feel like I am not worthy of love to some degree. And I do find myself very worthy of love. And so I don't really want to think, oh, you're too have and not to hold. No, because if I'm having you, if I'm choosing to have you, like, you're getting held. In the cuddling way as well as you don't get to take advantage of me. You don't. No, and I'm not saying that means I'm only explicitly at all times only looking for 
a long-term relationship or life partner, but to some degree I am, don't get me wrong. But I also don't see myself as someone to ever be strung along. And if it ever happens, I will bitterly dislike that person. And I'm not gonna be like, oh, I understand the rules. I'm gonna play that game. No, I'm not playing that game. You can play that game, you can try, but you will not succeed. It's quite possible that I may avoid this song. If I'm listening to this album all the way through, which given Frozen the Power Goodbye, at this moment, I'm sorry, I don't hate them, but they're bothering me right now. And so I'm gonna complain about them. I might not want to listen to this album all in a row. I might wanna play it on shuffle instead. And so I might like the song if it's earlier in the project. I don't know this current moment though. Track number 12 is Little Star. Oh my God, finally something upbeat. Ooh, it's getting experimental. Never forget how to dream. Never forget how to dream. Ooh, this production's getting interesting. You are a treasure to me. I think this is about her kid. Violins again. Still not the ones from Confessions on the Dance Floor. Little star. Oh, she whispered at that time. Oh. Showing a little more minimalist, but still showing the cool production choices that were made throughout. So that was Little Star, and that was really fun. I enjoyed it. I am getting a little tired. <laughs> and at this stage in an album reaction, it's bound to happen. But I did enjoy the song. I like how upbeat it is, even though the lyrics are delivered a little slower, and that's totally fine. I believe this song is about her child. And while I didn't do any research prior to it, I know when I looked up Shanti Ashtangi to try to figure out what was going on with that prayer, uh, I found out that she started doing yoga shortly after the birth of her first child. So this is a new mom album for or I believe this is her first album since she gave birth. I do not remember all the albums at this point, but this is a tribute, I believe, to that child. That's just gonna be my strong guess that's based on the idea of let yourself dream forever, don't be afraid to fly. All these messages that you tell someone who hasn't experienced as much life as you and you want to see them succeed and do well and continue keeping up their childlike whimsy because they're a literal child. I might like this song if I, kind of picture Madonna singing to me, I think that might be my best bet for it because I don't have a child at this moment. And I feel like even if I did have a child, I don't think I would listen to the song for that. I feel like it's a song that's meant to be sung to her child. And since I am definitely younger than Madonna, I feel like she could technically sing it to me if she wanted to. Do you want to, Madonna? I don't know. Also in the middle of listening to the song, I was thinking about how much I've been connecting Alanis and Madonna together. At the realization that Madonna was having her first child now, and Alanis is now in her mid forties and has children of her own. And that at 1988, Alanis is roughly what my age is now, which is wild because I was also born just a year after this album came out. Time is so weird, oh my gosh. It feels like three generations happening there. Okay, gosh. Yeah, we're all like 20 years apart, almost. I mean, give or take, I think me and Alanis are more like 23, 24 years apart. But still, gosh, time is wild. And people are writing stuff and living different lives at different times. And oh, my God. anyway, I had an existential crisis at 10.36 p.m. on a Thursday. Woo. So yeah, while I like it, I might have an existential crisis about it. I probably won't every single time I hear this song, but I also don't know what my feelings will be like. Again, maybe I'll like this song more if it's shuffled because after dealing with some slower songs, this one is definitely a nice relief, but I feel like I can't judge it fairly as a standalone track because I've heard 11 songs before it. Track number 13, last track on this album, Mer Girl, M-E-R, Mer. Mare? I don't know what that means at all. Is that also a yoga thing? I have no idea. Hopefully we will find out. Sounds like a phone beeping. 
Sounds like a two-tone hum we did in an uh, improv exercise. My mother who haunts me. Even though she's gone. Is this about her real life mother? Oh, this is so sparse. Why so minimalist? I ran to the forest. She's having like a whole story. I was looking for me. Ooh. Feels like the beginning of the album. I ran to the cemetery. I thought about your death. Is she talking to her mom? This feels like a mix of Alanis and Kate and Bjork and whoever else you want to throw in there. I could even throw in Mitski. I taste my fears. Ooh. I'm looking there still. I'm looking there still. Oh, she doesn't have the answers. What? Still running away. So that was Mer Girl, and apparently that's a term coined by Madonna. I did look that up because I needed to know. And also, this song felt Kate Bush esque, and so I needed to know some more information. Mer Girl is like mermaid, so it's like sea, but the girl part being instead of maid being like an immature mermaid. Like she's not at that point yet. And so this is a little bit about her mother passing away, which we did glean at and we knew from mother and father off of American life. And she apparently went to visit her mother's grave once and she just went out for a run and she just stumbled upon it. And then she realized that all that maternal influence is kind of gone from it. She was saying that she smelled the rotting flat how do you do that she's been gone for how many years at that point she passed away when you were five and i assume if you're allowed to go running on your own that you're not five anymore i don't know how long it takes a body to decompose at all burning flesh was she cremated or something i i don't know these are details i don't need to know about madonna's mom honestly but this is such an interesting song it really reminded me of your house from alanis and that it's so sparsely done. I think your house is fully a cappella. Yeah, I think that sounds right. But I think it is. I don't listen to that very much because it's also just on the, you know, the B side or the extra secret song on Jag Little Pill. And I just don't care for it because it's like, oh, you're glamorizing walking into someone's house and breaking in during and doing all that. It just isn't something that I want to listen to all that much. And similarly, this one is also like, I don't know, it unnerves me. I don't know why I necessarily feel that unnerved. I think the ending part was weird and also just when it's ominous throughout. I don't know, it's, it's odd to me. And so I haven't really fully placed it into how I could listen to it in a way that I would enjoy. But in terms of influences, I know I mentioned a lot of people here. And I think it's that they all are probably influenced at some point or another by each other. I heard some very random thing that Mitski was like today's Bjork, which does not sit right with me at all. No, I don't think that at all. But I feel like Alanis, I said for the Your House thing, Bjork in the way that you couldn't know exactly where the story was going next. I also could see this being in a more vaguely musical theater-esque thing, which I think Mitski is very good at being very theatrical in her performances. Kate Bush, similarly theatrical, similarly, like, I need to know what's going on in order to understand the song, potentially enjoy the song. It has an odd storytelling method. So I think all of those definitely are related to each other. I know Bjork has specifically said that she's been inspired by Kate Bush before. So at least we know that connection makes sense. But yeah, it's a very ominous song to end on. Said it was the standard edition, so there might be a deluxe, but the standard edition's already over an hour, as is. And I'm proud of myself for getting through it on a first listen and enjoying, I think, most of the record. With that said, we have finished this album. I have to say, that was a lot to think about. There was a lot to consider there. 
that I had not considered before. It reminded me most of supposed former infatuation junkie because there's a lot of Alanis influences, but also it goes all over the place like that album does. And that's not my favorite album from her because I love Flavors of Entanglement because I grew up in the 2000s and that's just 2000s sounds. But supposed former infatuation junkie is also up there. I don't remember exactly how I ranked all the albums in my album ranking of Alanis, but I can link that right now. But I believe it was fairly high. And I feel like this album similarly has its moments of being edgy, having its moments of being very happy. Not that either have big moments of being happy. I feel like Ray of Light was the happiest song on here. And Little Star, I would say, are pretty happy songs. And for supposed former infatuation, okay, you have So Pure, which is my favorite song on that album. Yeah, but you do have a lot of other emotional, moody songs. But this album just gets dark. I feel like Drowned World, you're gonna start with a title like that and then you're gonna go the murder girl and frozen i guess and heaven not to hold this album is very moody in a way that i haven't seen madonna be before i feel like with american life you have the moods of the easy ride or the american life but there's something almost i don't know if camp is the right word to it there's something a little lighthearted, even when she's dealing with a lot of serious topics. She does it in a very theatrical way. And this one just feels like she's going into her confessional singer songwriter, like, ah, like life is difficult. Nothing really matters. There's a lot of that in this project. And it's very, very intriguing as to why that is. I guess that is the 90s. The 90s, I feel like are very moody in terms of a lot of popular songs from it. But Madonna didn't have to do that. I know her popular songs are like Material Girl, Like a Virgin, Hung Up. Yeah, those songs that are popular and they're more upbeat and or they're generally positive or at least silly messages or I don't know, lighthearted, not necessarily silly, but the light energy is there. Whereas a album called Ray of Light it really just has a ray of light. It's not rays of light. The album is not all bright and cheery in the least bit, but it is upbeat in some points. It has some more experimental touches. It's very interesting of a project and I'm very intrigued to what I will discover as I listen to it more and more. It's not an album you're supposed to like on your first listen, I don't think, like fully. I don't think you can embrace it. And there's definitely some songs that, at least on my first listen, I don't care for at all but that is the nature of it. And I think there's some stuff that she just does interesting. She's intriguing me more and more with each album that I listen to from her, which is a good sign that I will probably continue diving into her and exploring her discography. Whereas some artists, when you've listened to, I don't know, four of their albums, you know what you're gonna get and you just exist. Whereas I guess I didn't really know where I was gonna get. I thought I was gonna get like a, more, I thought it was going to be more like acoustic, pop, light energy, like a, a sunshine yellow vibes. But there's some edge, there's some diving in deep, there's some bearing of emotion and unbearing of emotion. Yeah, I would love to hear what you think of this project. I got requested specifically to react to it more than other albums. So I'm very intrigued to what you all think of a project like this. I'm very intrigued to see what how I feel about a project like this in the coming days when I edit it and listen to it more and more. Also, I'm no longer nauseous, so thank you to the peppermint tea, the peppermint gum, or just this album, any and all. Thank you for your assistance. I feel a lot better now, which is great, so I can continue on with the rest of my night. With that said, here are some of my favorites of the top tier. The songs I love, the standouts, the ones I've been playing over and over again. Songs in the middle are songs I like all other than my plays, but they might not be at the top of the top. And songs in the bottom are just not really my thing. Doesn't mean they're a bad song, doesn't mean you can't like it. Just means it's not for me. That's okay. Madonna did not know I was going to be alive yet. Or did she? Maybe she knew that from Sky Fits Heaven. She knew what the future held or whatever. But I doubt it. I think this album I can enjoy now, but it wasn't made for me. If you like this video, please like it, please comment down below, which you react to or do next on my channel. Please subscribe to my channel if you're not ready and you'd like to be. And thanks for watching. This is Charles Drummer. Catch you later.
experience.